Shut up and sit down. Good morning, afternoon, or evening from wherever you're listening across the world. Welcome to another episode of Just Ball Things with me today. Keeping them nostril hairs nice and trim is the J-Man Jack Manuel. As always, a tremendous intro. How are you, buddy? I've never, ever, I've actually, no, maybe once trimmed my nose hairs. I have a big nose. I should be able to get up there, but I've just never done it. You just, you know, never had to. I mean, there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of nose, so that the nose hairs would have to get ridiculously long for them to <laughs> actually exit your nose. I'm, I'm, I'm notorious for the, uh, for the old stray nostril hairs around. I mean, if I can go in there and start pulling at my nostril and I feel a pinch, yeah, this is gross. Um, that's when I start getting the the trimmer up there. Anyway, we're all about manscaping, grooming. You know, you got to live your best life. Is that a website? <laughs> it is. Um, well, not dot au, mate. I mean, if if only we were sp- sponsored by sponsored. Um, yeah, you know, we. I'm getting real good at saying that real fast, Jackie boy. It's you a are. shame we're not sponsored. Yeah, not <laughs> uh, my name is Nick Musing. Jack. I had some time. I had some time off this week. Watched some basketball. It was great. Watched some Lakers games. It was great. Got a tattoo done, was not that great, and I will reveal, uh, I guess later on, it's still healing right now, it's very scabby, um, got it done on Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday this week, a uh, decent sized piece, and for those who are a fan of video games, will uh, will enjoy it. I did not get your face, Jackie boy. Uh, I asked and they said, listen, there's too much ugly on this photo. We can't get all the detail in Damn, that's on your savage. Arm. So Bro, I don't know whether that's an that's... indictment. I don't have big enough arms to capture your ugly uh, or if there's just too much ugly happening in your face. I'm sorry, Jack. I've, I've called you ugly four times now. Holy crap, that is so <laughs> mean. <laughs> um, yeah, so midweek was uh, tattoo. I had the TV, had the TV there with the basketball. It was a great time apart from the searing pain. Um, but I will, I'll post it on my Twitter at JBT Nick, give us a follow. Um, and yeah, you can, you can see it in all its glory eventually. Uh, so you can contact us at JBT Nick or at the J Man JBT. If you want to talk to us on Twitter, uh, we're also closely affiliated with OTG basketball. There's got an awesome news website. YouTube network, of course, you're watching us on YouTube where you can keep up to date with all things NBA. Make sure you follow them on Twitter at OTG Basketball and on YouTube at OTG Basketball. Facebook.com slash Just Ball Things. We are on there. Give us a like and a follow. jb 2 podcast at gmail.com if you want to email us. That is, that's that's pretty cool. You should do that. Um, all right, mate. Playoff edition. Playoffs are in full swing. We didn't get to a show last week, so we got a lot to catch up on. I think we didn't have a show. Yeah, we didn't. It was my big girlfriend's birthday. That's right. My, my fiance's birthday. Um, anyway. Fiance. <laughs> oh, God. That sound failed episode. That's so frustrating. <laughs> um, all right. We'll start off here with the music my wild scale. As always, for those of you who are new, this is a JBT created scale that sums up how likely things are to happen in the NBA. We scale it on alternative fact, Twitter fact. Wikipedia fact, or a straight up fact in that order. Jackie boy, the Nets, well, more more Kyrie Irving. I mean, the Nets are rolling. The Nets are rolling. Uh, and Kyrie Irving was wrong to bring up the issue of racism in his return to Boston. Obviously, earlier this week, uh, Nets up 2-0 at this point. Uh, I mean, 2-0, oh, yeah. 2-0 at, at the time. Difference. Coming back to boss, oh, going to you Boston. Want to play the music at all, Nick? You just completely missed your own cue. Oh, my friend. So sorry. Well, I mean, this isn't Brooklyn bits. This is this is just a music Manuel scale. Now, nah, stuff the Brooklyn bits. Now, nah, let's play Brooklyn bits. <laughs> Brooklyn, Abrupt end. Jack, back to business. <laughs> Obviously, uh, Kyrie Irving's. Um, comments uh before coming back to boston around hopefully that we can keep this all strictly basketball 
Uh, we've had a few incidences um, even prior to these comments um, regarding my my wizards with uh, Trey Young with the sp- Spitgate. Um, well, this is I mean Spitgate was something anyway. Anyway, um, so I mean I'm an alternative fact on this. He was definitely in the right in the right place. Like, what is the topic? I mean, <laughs> I've already topic? told I've already told you. Kyrie Irving was wrong to bring up the issue of racism on his return to Boston. That's what I said Sorry. earlier. And then I started the, not here, then you And then I started the context music. and then I started the music. It's just all out of whack. Jackie boy, he spoke about some ra- um some racial comments uh, that hopefully he can keep it to just basketball and that he hopes that no racism returns when he does uh, to Boston. And I'm an alternative fact on this one. He definitely, he was completely in his rights. So I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, look, I'm in exactly the same. And to check out a, a, a really pretty eloquent and, and studious conversation, check out Celtics Lab, my co of the Brooklyn Buzz, as well as the, you know, probably the only Celtics fans that I do like actually talked about <laughs> this general topic with a, a bit more clarity than probably what Nick and I will provide, but we'll do our best anyway. Uh, I think that the we, uh, we attacked the messenger. And it's Kyrie Irving. When Kyrie Irving says something, no matter what his message is, it's going to get attacked because it's Kyrie Irving and his previous instances and what he's said before. You know, the bubble and what happened in the bubble, pre-bubble, Kyrie Irving was one of the first people to be like, hey, are we going here for the right reasons? What's actually going to be getting out of this? And everyone's just like, why is he saying this? And then we see in the middle of the bubble the... You know, the, the furor that does happen, you know, the middle he bucks decided to leave. And, you know, without Kyrie Irving's, you know, willingness to disrupt and go against the norm, then I don't think those events do occur in, in the way that they did. Now, Kyrie Irving, I think these comments are maybe the least controversial that he has ever made. Because all he was just like in, in, a, in a post-game presser chatting to Matt Brooks and, and, and the Nets media, mm. he was essentially just like, look, I'm cool with back i don't mind the booze let's keep it 100 mm. don't want any belligerence or or anything extra and game three occurred and there were a lot of booze there were a lot of f kyrie a lot of booze he, he he didn't seem to be too phased by it um in terms like he egged it on a little bit he did play incredibly poorly and if you do want to hear my thoughts on on the game itself check out the Brooklyn buzz mm. but I don't think that those comments went overboard. We did also see, I've been, I don't know if you've been paying attention on Twitter the last couple of days, Nick. Even at Fenway Park, I think that's the, is that the Red Sox place? Where yeah, they it's, it's their baseball. It's their baseball. They were chanting F Kyrie there. I'm just like, rent free. You know, the, the yeah, real estate is exactly. <laughs> in Boston sports fans' head when it comes to Kyrie Irving at the end of the day. And, you know, we actually heard, um, I saw as well, his dad came out and sort of said, look, I get why Boston fans would be upset. You know, he did mm. say that he would come back if you'll have me. And he chose to sort of depart and, and, and head to Brooklyn. Mm. But ultimately, it, like, it, it's it's something that is, we're already seeing, like you mentioned, Nick, the instances of pretty awful fan behavior and disgusting fan behavior. There was obviously a sample size of I think about five, six, seven thousand 7,000 fans at, at TD Garden in game three. That's going to be increased to near full capacity, 17,000 or so. I think it's going to be a pretty relentless atmosphere. I don't necessarily think it's going to affect Kyrie Irving in any respect, but I know I put out a tweet early in the week, and you might have seen it, where I sort of just listed instances of, of Boston sports fans where racial comments or, or in racially insensitive comments were made to uh, whether it was an NBA player or whether it was a baseball player. And I could have made that tweet a lot longer and added a lot more photos if Twitter actually allowed me to do that. And now it's, again... We're not painting a broad brush that everyone in Boston is racist. But you can't deny the facts that Boston sports fans have chosen. And again, this isn't Mm. an isolated incident doesn't necessarily reflect an entire fan base. But ultimately, you can't ignore the instances that happen. And I think as long as we, we keep it 100 and just go, look, boo Kyrie, it's boo. It's pretty simple. Everyone deserves to... I, I, I did a little bit of a spaces as well on the OTG basketball account where I was sort of saying that the nature of the dehumanization of athletes that, that happens around the world, not just in, in the NBA, but I think it happens, it's a bit more prevalent in the NBA because the fans are right there. Like you're right next to them. You can hear them. You can touch them. You know, we've actually seen Russell Westbrook be pushed by a, a young boy before. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's right there. And, you know, the malice of the palace, obviously everything that did happen there as well. So I think that we need to realize that at the end of the day, 
Kyrie Irving and the 450 other guys in the NBA are human beings. And we need to not just tout them as just like black men for our entertainment or white men for our entertainment. They are human beings and they deserve to be treated with the level of respect and honor that every other human being does. You know, I don't have people coming into the primary school and spitting on me and throwing popcorn on me while I'm trying to teach kids. It, and like, it, it just, it, it begs belief that you can be so disconnected and disgusting at the same time. And look, I, I'll give Boston sports fans the, the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, it's a little bit annoying, you know, the, the booing and, and the F Kyrie stuff or whatever. Kyrie Irving's going to step up in game four and hopefully we do get the win. And, you know, maybe this time the energy is a little bit different because when you do put up and, and you, you cause the other team, uh, the opposing fans, to shut up. So, look, just keep it 100. Let's keep it at a level of empathy and respect. And everything is, everything's like just peachy. It's as simple as that. It, it doesn't need to be a big argument. I think Jalen Brown came out and sort of said that he thought that the comments were, the timing of the comments were a little bit off base. Now, go check out the guy, Nikias Duncan of the Dunker Spot. He did a little bit of a thread on why we seem to continue to sort of be like, oh, Kyrie Irving said this, so it's off base. You know, the timing of it is bad. And Jalen Brown and Kyrie Irving haven't had the most rosiest of relationships in his time in Boston. But in the comments that were made by Marcus Smart, by Tristan Thompson, all of them echo the sentiments that Kyrie Irving did make. Uh, even Bruce Brown, you know, his teammate, you know, when he was in high school, he was called a monkey of all things because of the fact that he was dating uh, a white woman uh, while he was spending his time at, at Boston High School, um, you know, practicing his sport or whatever. And it's just like, look, you can't deny the, the facts that are there. And again, you know, there's millions of Boston sports fans and Celtics fans around the world and in the Boston area. But there is a, a, a pretty strong correlation between racist, disruptive, disgusting, unruly behavior, and Boston sport. That's It's just plain and simple. You can do the same thing with other sports around the world, whether it's the Italian sports leagues, and the Italian soccer leagues, or, or wherever else you want to put it, because it, you can't deny the correlation, Nick. Uh, that's all I'll say. Yeah, I mean, you can you can say this in, in many, many facets of sport. I mean, we've seen a, a lot more uh, different countries approach this issue differently and then they've resulted in certain effects that happen you know the 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 way that that race is tackled in say Serie A the Italian leagues the La Liga the Spanish leagues compared to the English leagues you know um vastly different um it's ingrained in a in a footballing culture in some of these it's specifically football but I mean it, it, this extends to, to all sports um you know, even Australian rules, Australian yep. rules football. Um, yep. You know, it's it's awful, and it's it it only takes one. It only takes one in earshot, and you know there is a small percentage of people who are in earshot in a playoff game, especially. You have to be real close um, to for you know for these athletes to be able to hear. But and also Nick, just to sorry to interrupt. To go back to the sort of Jalen Brand thing, like I don't think timing should be the the issue that he has here, and I think that no, right. I mean, we do bring, is ra- is racial inequality a, a you know a bad is, thing to bring up at is any it, time? Exactly. Like, is, you know, is, I don't think the timing matters. Like I think if anything, actually, it's better because we do sort of get lost, and and I think that that's what we talked about in the bubble a little bit. Would the basketball take away from you know racial justice? And it, it did to an extent. Hmm. Whereas if we get Kyrie Irving sort of bringing it up now, maybe that's a good thing. I don't talk, understand we're talk, why. We're talking and, about it. We didn't, like, I didn't know it was a particular, like, there have been, uh, obviously, other stuff but before Kyrie Irving. Obviously, Marcus Smart had that, um, I think it was a player, tri- was it a Players' Tribune thing? I, re- I think I remember seeing a tweet yeah. um, about um, about racism in, in the sort of Boston market. And, well, I guess it was in the NBA in general, but, it, it, we're talking about it now. You know, other people are talking about it now. It's, it's starting a conversation that, and that in itself is quite amazing. And if, if he is more like, than, if he's more I, than I, happy I, to play himself as the villain in that, it at least starts the conversation. And I think that's where he's come from. He knows that he's going to get backlash. He knows that people are going to hate him even more. Sorry, yeah. He knows that I he's think- going to get the sh- like absolute crap boot out of him in Boston. But he sees the greater good in this and it feels like a lot of the actions that he takes 
he doesn't mind being the villain if it helps create something better and i think that's what he truly truly believes um it's, it's interesting nothing... to sort of hear because like i know you at the start of the season we had comments from him you know in relation to like lebron james and stuff yeah but we've probably i think the narrative has turned almost in, in a positive direction for the people that do pay attention to what Kyrie irving does off the court and the comments that he does make you know he seems to be a genuinely thoughtful caring and empathetic person and i i just uh, i think i saw a comment on twitter in relation to jalen brown's comments where it's just like okay if you see a bunch of white people agreeing with you you know that you've probably made the wrong comments so it's just like what is the white man's response what is the white dude's response to you know a, a person making comments about race and if they're the ones that are all outraged by it then those are the bad comments but you know everyone got pissed off at Kyrie Irving's comments so all the all white dudes and and Abby's on Twitter. So Kyrie's probably on the right track. So I'll, I'll <laughs> I think that's a decent criteria to go by. We could chat. We, we do like chatting about these more thoughtful topics for, for quite a bit. We do have a pretty big episode next. So right into a couple more topics. And Ja Moran has been out of his goddamn mind. And the Grizzlies are unlikely to lose the, the game today against the Utah Jazz. The only good game uh, that was on the, the, the cards today. And Nick, I put to you, let's go back. Ja Moran is better than Zion Williamson and Jason Tatum. Now, the giant Moran, the John Moran versus. Was this a was this a, a point that we had? Is that what we're getting at? Is is this something that we've discussed before between these three players? Because no. these three players seem like an odd choice. No, I chose these players because the John Moran, Zion Williamson debate gets brought up quite a bit in the yeah. same draft. Pick same one, pick draft. two, and Max Kellerman on first take said the John Moran is better than he would take him over Jason Tatum. So of course he did. I will, of- of course he fucking said that. Oh, God, he's the anyway. same player that... He's the same person that also said, I'll take Iguodala. Oh, <laughs> Iguodala. we got to sound, we got to soundbite that shit. That's fuck, that <laughs> is so good. we got to soundbite for that. It's absolutely incredible. One of the great soundbites. <laughs> Maybe even better than Stay Off The Weed, man. We love her. <laughs> on JBT. But Nick, what are your thoughts, I guess, on, on Ja Morant's form of late? I guess the, the topic itself in terms of his, you know, candidacy... Uh, against these two great up-and-coming stars in Zion uh, and Jason Tatum as well. I am a big fan of the Mismatch podcast. And I think that is probably all... The people who listen to that podcast, all you need to know about where I sit with Ja Morant. This guy is phenomenal. Um, the- Better than SJ, Nick? Yes, Jack, get that shit out of here. <laughs> Better than SGA. Um, this has been a freaking debate between me and him. Um, well, this year, really. It was only really this year. Um, his regular season was not tremendous. He really shocked us all in that first season. Didn't get the attention that obviously he deserved. Really flourished. Um, but what I absolutely love... I mean, we're seeing highlights here. He is, he is an absolute highlight package. That is that is for sure. Um, you got a three hundred and sixty dunk today. <laughs> there is there is no denying that he is. I mean, he's Westbrook esque in the fact that he's one of the most watchable players in the NBA, and that is tremendous for for Memphis. That is amazing. That's amazing for any franchise. I mean, we were speaking about Melo and how and what attention he brought to um a Car- uh, not Carmelo um Lamelo Charlotte yeah um. And what attention he brings to Charlotte. This is the same thing, and obviously this is his third year in the in the le- third year, yeah, third year in the league now. Yep. Um, but we're seeing him in the playoff stage now, and what what truly impressed me about this guy, amongst all of the good things that he brings, is his ability to impact winning, his ability to lead at such a young age, and just produce in the biggest moments. And we're seeing this in the playoffs. I mean. His forty-seven point night was incredible. There is a stat here from uh, from Yahoo Sports, um, which you which you sent to me, uh, Jackie Boy. Thank you. Um, the list of players in NBA history who have scored hundred points in the first three playoff games: Kareem, Wilt, George Mikan, and Ja Morant. That is it's pretty crazy. That is some elite company there. And not only I know that, there's like but a I Lucas saw it. stat as well. We're like averaging 32 points mm. over like his first nine playoff games as well. It's nuts. I'm really enjoying these playoffs for, for the sake of the young 
Mm. superstars making a name for themselves you know jason tatum obviously age 23 having a 50 yeah, point sure. game uh, against us in, in game three trey young doing some in- incredible things as well and obviously luke uh, continuing to be you know he's made for playoffs man that yeah, dude is, is absolutely crazy and hopefully he is healthy and we'll get to some clippers matters later but nick uh, you, can, you can continue out uh, the old jar morant stand I'm, I'm a big fan <laughs> of it yeah he's, he's he's just incredible yeah he's his ability to um impact winning is is tremendous um you sort of, I sort of lost my uh, train of thought there. Oh, with um, with the hundred point scoring, I saw a comment. It's just like, well, you know, how many threes was uh, was Kareem and Wilt taking? <laughs> how many threes do you reckon Jar has taken over these three games? Sorry, how many threes do you reckon yeah, you he's made over these over these games with a hundred points? Look, uh, I'm gonna go six. Four. Four three oh, pointers. Yeah. He had a donut in his first game. He hit two in his second game. So he had forty seven points with two three pointers. Is incredible in today's age. The guy, the guy is shooting about fifty seven percent from the floor. He's attacking. He's relentless. Is three. Uh, he's he's actually shooting quite poorly from three. Um, he's taken quite a few, uh, but he's only managed to hit four, and. The, the guy is just, I mean, he's young, you know, he's young, he's attacking. And there's this, there, there's this thing for Ja Morant since he entered the league that he, he attacks the lane at such, with such ferocity and goes down, can go down quite hard because he is still going and you hold your breath every single time he does that. Um, cause this guy is such a talent. You really don't want one of those falls to, you know, he, it looks like he's got no control that the speed and ferocity he's attacking it, but he's. He's got complete control. It is it is incredible, and not many players can um, can boast that. Uh, to say that he is a better player than Zion and Jason Tatum, I'm unsure about Tatum. I mean, the guy it, it, Zion Williamson was a tremendous player on a you know pretty poor team. I would say that right now, Ja Moran is impacting winning on Memphis at a greater level than Zion Williamson. Uh, does that make him a better player? I guess that's that's to each their own. Counting stats, not as good, of course, um, but his leadership on the court uh, and just his ability to turn up uh, when it matters is is amazing. But Tatum also has that, and has a, a, a has a I guess a better team around him and a more polished and has the counting stats. So, I mean, I'm not taking I'm not taking Morant over Tatum. Uh, I I don't think I'd go that far. But he is. He is truly amazing. I, I love him. Uh, I love Marine. He is, he's so enjoyable to watch. Yeah, you mentioned, you said that pretty well there, Nick, but I, I want to give some uh, a shout out to the level of control that he does have, despite mm. the fact that we, we see the flashiness, we see the athleticism. You know, he is incredible inside the paint, even on that floater. Like he, he like Trey Young's a Trey Young and him like have both two of the best floaters in the, the game. Floaters, you know, the Conley. floaters these days are becoming a, a seriously legit shot. And there was discussion when Luca hit that floater against Memphis to win the game, uh, that 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 floating three. And Chris Vernon mentioned, I mean, going back to the mismatch, uh, that he doesn't reckon it's a long time until, or maybe it was KOC, um, doesn't reckon it's a long time until you start seeing three-point floaters become a legitimate shot in the NBA, which would be insane. It would absolutely be insane. Imagine, like, because the level of control these modern guys have on their floaters, I mean, it's the same thing when you start seeing more and more people hit threes. It's like, oh, we can actually control the, uh, (laughs) Jesus, 360 layup. Um, The we can control the the level of threes and, and hit these at a good clip. It took a while to get to that point. And I think he's right. It may not be a long time before we start seeing these these floaters from, from three because the modern, these young guys, their floater game is incredible. Continue. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, look, and, 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 and no, you're, no, you're right, mate. The, the reason why I love Jars as well is because Jars happen with, with such speed and normally a lot of people... The, the floater itself, you know, when we've, we both play a little bit of casual basketball here and there, when you shoot the floater, you have to slow down, get some control, and then, you know, put your hand up. Ja Moran doesn't really stop. And, like, he he, he shoots it with such ferocity, f- velocity, velocity, and mm. speed with the control, with the poise at the same time. I love it. One of my favorite shots of his. 
But to put him in this category, I, I understand why you would put him in the same category as Zion, Nick, because, you know, you are a Zion hater. You don't even think he should be playing in, in the league right now. We all know about your your love, oh, your lack of love, sorry, uh, for Zion. Well, <laughs> for those listening along at home, uh, Nick is giving me a very rude gesture that is offensive uh, in many cultures. <laughs> uh, what I will say in, in, in relation to Jason Tatum is, you know, Jason Tatum has, has done it a bit more consistently. Yeah. And I think that the wing position is a... a a much more a more valuable position for success in the modern NBA. Not to say that John Morant can't they get say I don't know Kate Cunningham in the draft or, or or another wing guy. That I think that that could change the trajectory of their franchise. I do like Jaron Jackson Jr. You know, obviously had a, a bit of troubles coming back from uh, he had a really nice game today. I just think that we've seen John Morant before. You mentioned like you know Russell Westbrook, John Wall, yeah. these sort of really athletic crazy guards. Whereas I think Zion Williamson is a a, a transcendent player. He mm. might not turn out like we could out of these three. John Rand could have the best career out of all these guys, but I think that the the upside out of all of them, Zion is is MVP level. Zion is Hall of Fame mm. level, and but he could also he also has an incredibly low floor because of just all the other things. And I know one of my favorite lines from Homer on The Simpsons is like you know transcendent, groin grabbingly transcendent. That's how transcendent Zion Williamson is. So. You know, if we were to do a DBS, I would unfortunately have to to drop my uh, drop the the man who has maybe one of the best highlight reels uh, over the first two and a half seasons of his career, three seasons of his career. Sorry, but it's just the nature of, of this one. And you know, I think that on this we can provide a little bit more nuance and still provide credit and not be one way or the other. Yeah. Like on those takey shows where it's just like one guy yeah, or the well, other. It's, it's and the you have highlights. To it's, it's the freaking headline. It's the headline takes. It's the clickbait stuff. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm with you. I mean, I mentioned that, you know, Zion has tremendous counting stats. Maybe hasn't really figured it out with the, you know, team composition. Doesn't have that, maybe that level of play. Um, you know, and he's still young. Like these are still crazy young guys. It's not to say that Zion can't even develop that. Um, and Zion may have the better better career, and if we're talking again like counting stats, then then Zion has it in, in absolute droves because he is this this physical specimen, um, and like that has the potential to be this transcendent talent. Um, it's just based on right now, and right now it's just Jai has started tremendously hot. Um, He's clicking with everything in the in the Memphis, you know, Memphis locker room and the Memphis organization, and just instant energy. They took that game one from um, Utah, and everyone's just like, "Oh, here we go! This is a one eight. We believe Memphis." Um, but you know, two one up now. Um, two one up now. Hopefully, uh, they get game Utah. Four. Hopefully, they get game four. Yeah, a Make split. A split at either side. Um, would be, I mean, far out. It's probably one of the one of the best one eight matchups, at least of recent memory, considering the number one seeds like we've, we've had. It's always, yeah, th- those sort of teams, <laughs> which is always a blowout. And look, the exactly. Miami Heat weren't, weren't necessary. And we'll get to the Heat a little bit later as so well. We've got a lot of topics to get to, but yep. we got to talk about the Lakers at least somewhat on this podcast, Nick. And mm-hmm. Charles Barkley always has takes of some sort, and he said that the Brooklyn Nets would sweep the Celtics. And look what happened in Game 3. Thanks, Chuck. Whenever you say something, it never happens. He also thinks that the Bucks are going to win the championship. So hopefully that comes to fruition, or doesn't come to fruition in terms of the Chuck style. But he did also say this about the Lakers, Nick. Nobody is afraid of the Los Angeles Lakers. Nick, are you afraid of the Los Angeles Lakers? They're a bit scary. Purple and gold, you know. It's a weird <laughs> combination of colors. You should be afraid. 100%. I mean... They're the championship team. I mean, again, this is fucking clickbaity shit. Why aren't we on these goddamn uh, news outlets, Jackie boy? Um, a hundred percent, you should be. You should be afraid. This this is a championship team with championship caliber players. Uh, they have strengthened in some areas. They've they've gotten a bit lax in other areas. Um, but look at how they're handling the 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 two seed. And if this was. If this was flipped... Look, it's the two seed with Chris Paul with one arm. Yes, that's true. It is true. Um, but we're also seeing... I mean, John Terry Aiden has been an absolute freaking... He's been great. He's, he's been, been better than Anthony Davis this series. He's been better. I don't give a shit. He has been absolutely stellar, um, I, I, I must admit. Surprisingly. I mean, first first playoff instance, you don't really know what to, what to expect. 
and I certainly didn't expect this from Aiden. Uh, mainly because you know one one year in the league, man. I'm getting I'm losing track of these goddamn. He's up to be second year. This is second year. year. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Who's for, who's who's who, Actually, no, 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 no. I think it might be his third year, or I don't know. Oh, I, I don't know. I've lost the eighteen draft, wasn't it? Oh, Him, I've... Luca, Trey Young, and Marvin Bagley. I think. Oh yeah, I think draft. you're right. I think you are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh god, I can't. I'm very much removed. As soon as they're not rookies anymore, they're just like every other player. <laughs> that's it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I said this was his first year. Anyway, um, yeah, it's very surprisingly uh, effective and has not been played off the court uh, with Anthony Davis on there at all. At all. He's very much holding his own. Um, but the Lakers seriously need to just play at half a basketball, maybe even less, to win these games. Um, if this was flipped, no one fears the Phoenix Suns. I could possibly believe that. Fresh playoff team, not a lot of pedigree. Uh, great players, great team, month, like well coached, um, and like great system. And you're getting like freaking massive contributions for like campaign and shit. Like, this, feel the pain. Just this is an exciting team. They're just an exciting team. Um, but the late the, the playoffs are a different game. It's not the late regular season. You have time to plan and really get into the details, which is where LeBron James loves to live uh, in these games. And they've done it before. They've, they've played, they've played obviously all the rounds to a championship last year. They know what needs to be done. And I mean, you're not going to doubt LeBron in the first round. I mean, he hasn't lost a first round in 14 years or something like that. Like, insane. Or in his career. Like, is it, has it been in his career? Maybe he has. I think he, uh, I, yeah, that's a good I remember point. seeing on Twitter 14 years, but then I don't remember him ever losing it. For, anyway, I'll believe Twitter. Twitter fact. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even though Twitter fact is below Wikipedia. Anyway. Um, no, this is alternative fact. You should 100% fear the Lakers. They have done it before. They've proven it. You know, these guys presumably will get healthier and healthier as they're going. We saw... LeBron James take it easy for two and a half games and then turn it on in that second half, second half of game three. That's all he needs to do. And, you know, I, I, I get lulled into this as well, Jackie Boy. So I, I look at LeBron, I'm like, ooh, maybe he's a little hurt. Maybe he's slowing down a little bit. He's not driving. He's not attacking. He's just passing, facilitating, being that floor general. But he attacks when he needs to attack. He has got this whole... The whole game, not just the not just these specific games. He's got the whole sport of basketball just around his fingers. He is his ability to manipulate series and games is second to none. This is why this is why you don't this is why you don't knock LeBron James. You don't deny him in a seven game series when generally the best team across seven games will get through. And we're seeing this now. I mean, two one up. It's got to be hard for Phoenix from here. Two one down. Look, I think in yeah. Look, uh, I'll give it a, a strong wiki because I think if you're in the West, I don't think there is a contender to them right now with the the way they're playing and you know LeBron James and Anthony Davis working themselves into form. I really do get sick of the flopping from LeBron and oh, Anthony yeah, Davis. Of course, of course. it's a, a little bit frustrating and you know certainly tarnishing my love for for the Lakers. If I did have any, you know they're probably one of our biggest rivals right now. Mm. And in terms of fan bases as well uh, on Twitter. So I, I think that though the teams out in the East don't have a lot of fear. You know, those top three, you know, Lakers, Bucks and Sixers, the way that they're going, you know, they are in form, they are happy. I don't think they hold any fear at all for this Los Angeles Lakers mm. team because... And they should, they're well built. All three of those teams very well built to handle the Lakers as well. Um, although I, I, I think the Nets are their biggest fear. <laughs> and I, and I, I just do think as well that they are working things out in the playoffs, whereas the Bucks seem to be pretty solidified. You know, incredible sweep of the Miami Heat. The Sixers are a, a toy with the, the Wizards right now. Mm -hmm. And look, hopefully by the time this, uh, you know, the, the Nets are taking care of business when it comes to Boston. But the way they played game one and game two, they're certainly running out into some form as well. Not necessarily health issues other than Jeff Green, which I'm, you know, pretty disappointed about. And hopefully that's not a, a long-term issue for him. But... Yeah, the way that LeBron James toys with players, you mentioned that there, Nick. So, I mean, yeah, we, the just West, saw the high, yeah. we just saw the highlight with Jay Crowder, the very famous yeah. one going around. I mean, it's 
it, it, he's Almost got the whole to... he's got it on a string jack uh this is yeah, it, it it reminded me a little bit of when he's like spitting the ball in, in serge barker's yeah. face when back when he was in toronto and i'm just like you you know you don't do this man that's not fair um but i will say you know that might be some teams might be afraid of the los angeles lakers but the scary hours are in brooklyn nick Jackie boy, please don't. Not me bad. That. Come on, give me a little. That was pretty no, good. Don't fill me with that crap. I don't know. The Lake, the Lakers. Are, <laughs> the, the, the scary. The, the bad thing about, I guess, the Bucks. Very impressive, and you, you've got it. You, you have to trounce the the Heat. That is such a statement win. Incredible. Um, but uh, peaking at the wrong time. You know, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. The playoffs are a very hard place to get through all, you know, the whole way. And sweeping your first round is a very good way to get all the rest that you need to to, to get this marathon going. And the Lakers are not playing good. The Lakers are not playing good. They have been actually quite disappointing offensively um, so far. And that that is what scares what that is what should scare people they are not hitting the three they are poor from the field but their defense is so suffocating and exasperating that it's god that's got to be a that that is as much of a mental block as it is a physical like drain that has to be i mean it's great and they've hung their hat on it that's the sort of keys to their success and i think that's why they can go far and eventually i have faith that they will get their offense going and i I think they don't need a peak now and they know that anthony davis and lebron know that they do not need to flip that switch yet um but it may come to bite them on the bite them on the bum uh in future rounds Dangerous game to play. Mm. Another team that's playing very dangerously is the Los Angeles Clippers, Nick. And <laughs> look, they won game three. They did okay. A nice little you know, little comeback there in the opposing arena. But I'll put to you, my friend, Clippers Mavs is do or die for Los Angeles. I mean, it has to be. They can't, they can't lose in the first round. Uh, and this sort of just brings to light all of the things that we were saying in Cleveland. And I was very much on... I was very much on the pro Ty Lu bandwagon because I'm like, you know, it can't be easy. It can't be just anyone can take a LeBron team to the finals. And, you know, and I truly believe that with Vogel as well. But I'm seeing Ty Lu scheme against this Mavericks team and come up with absolutely nothing. Like, Ty Lu's not the leader in that locker. And it's the same, it's exactly the same problems as last year. Ty, like, Ty Lu is not the leader of that locker room. And I can't... Uh, Rivers was not the um, leader of that locker room. Kawhi's not the leader of that locker room. I don't think Paul George is good enough. There is no leader. Exactly. It, exactly. This is the problem with the Lakers team. And what did they... I mean, they did absolutely nothing but- to solidify that spot. And it's it's coming up here. Like, a team with a with a tremendous leader in... in in the Grizzlies, in in the Mavericks, approving their stock in the playoffs, and that's where leadership can really take you far, you know. Um, and obviously, Kawhi gets a lot of praise for the Raptors win, rightfully so. Um, he was tremendous, but he was not the leader. He never has been, and I guess this is sort of what Pop was saying back in back when he was in the Spurs. Like he's a great player, but he he doesn't have that leadership quality. And it's really hurting the Clippers right now. Those first two games were dire. They had to win that game three. They couldn't possibly go into Dallas down 3-0. That that is an impossible situation for for the Clippers. At least now it's a bit of a tenable three, uh, sorry, 2-1. But I I still think the, the Mavericks take this in six at the most i don't see this going seven um and i mean what do you like if if they if they the, I, they either lose this one they either lose both games in dallas or they'll lose their away their home game which i don't know i don't know the 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 clippers the la series was split so it's hard to it's hard to say 
but I don't think that the Mavs will um will will drop another one in Dallas. And this is this is bad. This is bad for the Clippers. They lose this series and look I'm- it could be a one and done for Ty Lu. Are you there, Jackie boy? I seem to have uh lost you for a bit. Anyway, I'll keep talking about the uh I'll keep talking about the Clippers while you 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 fix fix your stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's the, the it's <laughs> it's the lack of leadership in this in this locker room, and at, you know you mentioned it there before. Um, are you with me, Jack? Uh, he's still there. Um, yes, you mentioned yes. It. Yeah. Oh, okay, there yeah. you go. Sorry, I was waffling there for a bit. I was trying to stall for you. Um, yeah, so I, I think I I just finished on like if they you know. I don't think the Mavericks... The Mavericks don't take this to a seven-game series. I think the Mavericks win in six or less. Look, in terms of do or die, Nick, I, I, I understand the, the urgency surrounding it or whatever, but I, nothing is really going to change in Clipperland. No, like, they, what they can need, you change they, again? They need a Jimmy Butler. <laughs> and then you get. Well, like, I wouldn't say it's Jimmy Butler to be honest. I understand. Well, what you're I mean, saying there's some there's some fri- there's some friction between the Heat. Uh, I mean, maybe some friction. Apparently, it's all fake news. I don't don't know what's going on with that situation. Um, but I honestly, you need someone like that, or you need some incredibly vocal role guys. You need some Jared Dudleys in there, Jackie Boy. Yeah, you need look, some Marcus Smarts. I mean, they had that. I, they had that. I think. I think that they. Uh, last year, you know, Marcus Morris tried to play that role, exactly. and, you know, uh, acquiring R- Rajon Rondo. Mm. And whether those guys are, are being heard in the level that they are, I don't know. A lot of the time, your best player needs to be one of your leaders, you know, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, Bradley Beal, whoever, uh, whoever it might be. Mm. But in terms of the do or die statement, I don't think it is. It's because this, it's going to happen in you don't next think, year. Jack? I, think, I, I don't think Kawhi is going to leave because Kawhi's pretty happy with the the life that he leaves in the life that he leads sorry in clipperland he gets to turn up and do whatever he the hell he wants but if it's he's not gonna, gonna get ha- paid if it's not gonna happen this year why the hell would it happen next year because w- what else do they do nick like the the only other option they have is essentially probably trading paul george which is you know i don't think paul george i think paul george has an okay series i don't think he's been great or bad um i think that you know if he had have had the series that paul jo- in fact no i'll say that for the the topic that we'll be getting up to but you know uh, ultimately and you know you got luke canard on maybe the worst deal in the league and shout out to my dude sam quinn of cbs sports saying that his contract uh, is going to be better than joe harris's Pwah, how that one's panned out my dude uh, <laughs> thanks to, for that peter peter griffin lookalike but yeah in all honesty nick I don't think it's really going to change anything. And there's a party that actually does think, and look, I'm not just gone by what Serge Barker puts on Twitter. I think that they've got a chance to win this. And you, I'm not saying that it's a guarantee, but I think Luca's injury now opens the door even more so because Chris Porzingis mm. <laughs> saw an awesome, um, I don't know if I, I don't think I actually did share the tweet with you. I shared it with um, Nick and Corey. Chris Porzingis is, uh, look, he's, um, I don't have enough, time to, to get into what Chris Dapps is right now but uh, there was a, a tweet sort of saying you know we should no longer refer to Chris Dapps as a 7 foot 3 with the way that he plays he's forever 5 foot 27 <laughs> that was just like, <laughs> that is very good just like, that's, uh, that, that's really good so I think that the Clippers might actually win this series and you know what I'll put it out there I think that they're going to win this series I think they're going to come back and then pull off an upset and for the sake by the time of, we for the sake of everyone in Clipperland I truly hope that happens because there's no like, I feel like there's no shame in Dallas going out what is going to go wrong like you're not going to lose Kawhi Paul, you can still have your two best players and Sam is the richest owner in the league. He can, he's essentially like the Saudi Arabian with Manchester City. He can buy his way out of problems, it seems. Well, obviously, it's not necessarily working for the Clippers right now. I think that what we're seeing in the Clippers is what you're sort of saying in terms of leadership and culture do matter, even to a little extent. Yes, talent is obviously the the be and then the 
rest of it. You need to have a semblance of culture, accountability, all of those things to sort of drive success. And mm. you know, it's happening a little bit in Brooklyn land right now. I think that there's a there was an embedded culture there and the superstars fit alongside that. Yeah. But I, I ultimately think that culture does matter a little bit and something has to change in Clipperland for that to... to to realign you know maybe it's a front office thing maybe it's an assistant coaching thing but uh, i don't know what it is nick but i don't necessarily think anything is going to change tremendously because ultimately what can you do they're hamstrung with the salary cap they're hamstrung with the the assets that they do have on that roster so i think we might just see the the wheels and keep on turning and look they're fine they're going to be a, a good team anything that has you know two players two top 12 players is going to be somewhat successful but they're not going to be you know probably the the behemoth mm. that we all thought when the trade was first made yeah for sure i mean we had we put more stock into leonard than we probably should have um and i'm certainly guilty of that obviously fresh off the raptors win it was hard not to um but I guess you're right in the fact that it's not do or die. They don't start going into the tankathon next year. But, man, this is indicative of, you know, the first year was sort of like, yeah, there's no leader, uh, but they haven't really gelled. They haven't really had a lot of time to get to, you know, to, to play these minutes together. And we sort of lent on that crux a little bit. And obviously the leadership issue was brought up, you know, uh, as well. And this was supposed to be the year for the Clippers. If you were to compare them to an English Premier League team, Nick, who would you compare them to? Like, you know, out of the, the big sort of teams out there, are they an Arsenal? Are they a, a Leicester City in terms of they're getting all this talent there they're always sort of missing out a little bit? Are they a Tottenham? You know, they've got, you know, well, um, I was gonna, some young I, men I, and they've I, got I, Harry Kane. Yeah, I felt like Tottenham is maybe one of the better because they do have, like, Tottenham have two truly amazing yeah. players um yeah. and you know and a good uh, they had they had a good coach but his voice was not being heard um and that could just be through a lack of leadership i mean i don't know enough about the tottenham squad to really comment let's get anyone on let's give him a call <laughs> but it's you know the changes that they made last year did not address any of this leader any of these leadership uh, issues uh and it could be, and I think you may have disconnected when I said this, it could be a one-and-done year for Ty Lu, Um because... Whoa! This, big call, big call, this, big call. They lose first round? If they lose in this first round, Jack, I... How are you going to... Like, what are you going to replace him with, you, Nick? Are you going to replace him with an unproven coach? Is it a yes, Nick McMillan sort of uh, situation? You, you, you like, go for energy rather than pedigree. You go... Well, like Nick Nurse sort of style? Yeah, in terms 100%. Of the, like, you sort of need... Dwayne. The, the talent is there, Jack. You keep Kawhi Leonard, proven talent. You need someone to lead the team. You needed a, a Kyle Lowry, you know? Maybe, obviously, you know, not so, not maybe not, but someone like him, you know? And I don't, I, and it's easy for me to sit here in my chair and say, you need a leader. Where do you find it? I don't have that answer. But that leadership may not potentially come from on the court. It, it needs to come from uh, coaching staff. If it's not on the court, it needs to come from coaching staff. You need someone to really inspire these guys and just bring out the best in your best players. Because right now, I don't, I don't think there's a... I, I feel like there's a lot of unknowns, even amongst the Clippers themselves. What's my role? You know, it's not as... It's not as regimented as a Lakers team would be because LeBron James will sit you down and be like, you need to do exactly this and you need to do it well. The clarity, the precision of the direction that you have cannot be understated when you're when you're chasing a championship. And I think a lot of, you know, Kawhi will come in day in, day out, do his thing, but probably won't voice what he wants from his role players. And if it's, if not him, then it needs to be the coach. The coach needs to sit down and be like, this is exactly your role. And maybe they are doing that, but it doesn't seem like they're doing that from the performances we're getting on the court. And it's bad. I mean, <laughs> cliff notes, uh, poor leadership on a team is bad, TLDR. Um, there we go. Yeah. 
Max Kellerman put it perfectly, Nick. I want Iguodala! Maybe, uh, maybe Iggy solves it all. Look, I have no idea. But I, I don't... I'm, the check coaching change could change something, but I think it's I'm just, just saying, again, it, it could but, It could be a one and done. If they're not, re- if they're not ready to, to deal with personnel change uh, with, uh, on the court, then it, it could be as drastic as a one and done head coach change. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, to provide a couple of analogies, it's, it's the hamster wheel. It's just, mm. it's going to keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. I don't know if they need to change something or if there is... We, we thought that the bubble might be sort of a one-off anomaly and yeah. then, you know, the, we did see the changes. Doc is doing some great things in, in obviously Sixerland right now, but, you know, I'll, I'll provide another analogy that uh, Stewie Griffin, the, the great wordsmith himself, when he was sort of building up his little mini cubby house, he sort of said, my house is built of mediocrity. And maybe that, maybe it's just so embedded in you know what the Clippers are mm. and what they have become, the little brother syndrome, that nothing is going to address it. And it's mm. just going to be a continual thing no matter who is there, unless it is a LeBron James or a, a Chris Paul, a Kevin Durant. You know, and funnily enough, Nick, you didn't mention Jimmy Butler. Kawhi Leonard asked a lot of players to, to join him in Clipperland. Jimmy Butler was one of those mm. guys. Kevin Durant was one of those mm. guys. Eventually, Paul George was the, the player. And Paul George has always been... The perfect 1B, you know, in, in a lot of scenarios, apart from Indiana, where I think he was at his best and we did see the best version of him. And he had, had an incredible um, regular season too. But, well, I guess it sort of ties us in nicely into our final topic. And we don't have any music for this, but we do have to talk about Paul George and Jimmy Butler, Nick. And Nick, I will put to you, Jimmy Butler deserves equal slander to that of Paul George. Now, I will say this is an alternative fact. He deserves way more. He was trash, absolute trash against the uh, Milwaukee Bucks. And, you know, you can wake up at 3 a.m. and work out as much as you want, my dude, and get the biggest biceps and deltoids in the world. you got to win a freaking game and hit a three-pointer, Jimmy. Come on, Jimmy. Jackie boy, I want to throw some numbers at you. Jim- numbers, I love numbers. And I know how much you hate this stat, but I like it. Oh, and God. you can probably guess what stat it is. <laughs> plus minus. The plus minus of ah, these three playoff sh- games <laughs> is jarring. And I know he's on the court. He's he's playing, you know, 40 minutes a night. Well, in the blowout, he actually was not playing. Did you see Drew Holiday was plus 41 in game three? Was he? No, I didn't see that. Holy shit. It's second greatest plus minus uh, individual performance ever. Plus oh, wow. 41. <laughs> that may be an indication of what we're about to uh, what I'm about to say. Then the plus minus game one minus eight, game two in 31 minutes minus 34 minus ah. 26 game uh, game three and basketball reference has not updated for game four. But let let me find that out for you right now. In well, sort of, I also do think that the. The general, the scoring performances. You know, we you need your best player to go out there yeah. and you know, get the team on his back. Like, he's shooting like shit. Like, it, so is Bam. Like, both of their yeah. best players have, like, ass. They've been so freaking bad. Like, you know, and Duncan Bam Robinson. had a good game Hill, four. Bam yeah, had a good I mean, game like, four. He, But no free throws. Yeah, yeah. No free throws for Bam, which is insane. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and Brooke Lopez uh, did a tremendous job. I, I think he deserves a lot of credit with the way that he defended. Uh, and Mark Budenhoser deserves a little bit of credit too in terms of the yeah. fact that he's been able to actually change a few things here and there in terms of their on-court product. And I uh, think Drew Holiday changes a lot too. He might have been their best player this, this series. And, and I don't yeah. think that I'm going out on, on a limb to I say mean, that. It's been, but said, it's Jimmy been Butler, said once, Jack. It's been said many times that... Bledsoe is a worse player than Drew Holiday. Crazy. Yeah, it's, uh, we're providing some cutting-edge analysis <laughs> on this podcast today. Um, but one other thing that I wanted to also bring up is I saw a, another funny tweet where it was if if Paul George was performing as badly as Jimmy Butler is right now, we would be beheading him in public. And I was just like... Yeah, I mean, that's uh, the, the level of extremity that we go with Paul George. And, and he brings it on himself a little bit with the comments that he does mm-hmm. make. And he, he did it even after game two as well. But Jimmy Butler, I think, does it in the same sort of way. But it's almost like anti-Paul George. He's just like, I'm just going to work. I'm stupidly locked in. Yeah. Well, maybe you should be intelligently locked in next time, Jimmy. And you won't have minus 800 in four playoff games because 
Uh, I, I think that we get this, we have this weird fascination with the aura and, and mythology of, of Jimmy James Buckets. But we've Jimmy seen it work, Jack. Jimmy Buckets. We've, se- we've seen it work, Jackie boy. The, and this is the... This is I mean, the, we have seen it work. We've never seen Paul George. the most recent iteration. Work. But uh, I, look, in... in we need to judge it what it currently is, though, Nick. That's I what I, I think. I think is- past history needs to come into a, uh, come into play here because that, that it's just like saying. You say Jimmy Butler is going to go back to what he was in in the bubble because no. I think his best days are behind. No, him. no, you're right, but potentially, but the way that Jimmy Butler approaches the game is not necessarily bad. You know, are we are we trouncing are we trouncing LeBron? Are we trouncing LeBron for not attacking in game one and two of the Phoenix Suns games? No, because they win. Like he has, but because they're two one up right now, they didn't get swept by a team that they beat four one in last year's playoffs. Yep. I think we need the like I I I'm I'm always a person who's just like ju- tell me what you've done for me lately, and what Jimmy Butler's done for me and and, and Miami Heat fans and NBA fans lately is fuck all. I'm sorry to swear because I get. I get annoyed by it because I think we need to judge people with the same level of criticism and praise mm. along the way. It doesn't matter what your name is and what your personality is, whether you're Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, James Harden, you deserve this, the equal amount of slander, criticism and praise depending on what you produce. And yes, like LeBron James, like you said, Nick, can just turn it on. And he, that's what, why he is the way he is. Kyrie Irving, I gave a heap of criticism towards basically his game three performance, but I've given him an immense level of praise given the, the 50-40-90 all-NBA level season that he has had. Jimmy Butler had an incredible regular season, but the playoffs is where it matters. And Jimmy Butler knows that, and he's probably criticizing himself and probably going to wake up at 2 a.m. tomorrow and go to the gym uh, yet again. But I just think that we need to keep it 100 for every single player. Mm-hmm. And I think that if anything, if Jimmy Butler is bringing on this, relishing the, the challenges for himself, then he should warrant the criticism as well. Because what he has done is, is nothing to write home about, Nick. And you put it out there plainly to see. You're right. You're right. He has been quite poor. Um, I, I think it's exacerbated as well by the sweep. And the sweep... It's probably naive. I was about to say the sweep has nothing to do with Jimmy Butler. That's not true. He needs to play well. He's the st- he's the leader of this team. But it's a cascading. F- it's 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 a it's a you know double edged sword. Not a double edged sword. Anyway, I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. The heat got worse, just outright, and the Bucks outright got better over the off season. These are not the same teams that were played in the bubble. Ariza is not even a poor man's Jay Crowder. Especially yeah, especially the way Jay Crowder played last year. Dragic Crowder's not that good on the Suns now though. No, so. you're right. But but Jay Crowder was also not very good oh, no. on the um Cavs. No, no, he was good. In, he was good on the Celtics, and then when he moved, yeah, yeah, yeah. very much uh, organizational player. It feels um, doesn't work everywhere, and the, one of the most street uh, streaky. Anyway, um, Dragic is not the same as Bubble Dragic. He- Hero, obviously, not the same as Bubble Hero. They have been. Can you believe they wouldn't trade him for James yes, Harden? Yes, I mean, all of those trade manager. packages now are laughable. Um, <laughs> we got it. You know, it it's it's different. This is completely different teams and it's and maybe maybe the Heat take a game. If Jimmy Butler wasn't having a bad series, maybe the Heat take a game. But it it doesn't combat the fact that the Heat are fundamentally worse and the Bucks are fundamentally better than they were last year. Not only that, but the, the the Bucks were out for blood. The Heat were playing with borrowed money. It felt like this this series, and the Bucks wanted the statement, and they fucking got it. <laughs> they certainly got it. Um, so I I just think that this was a recipe for disaster for the Heat. It's not surprise. It's you know. It's it's not surprising that the Bucks won, given everything on paper, 
And this is the thing we were sort of counting. Oh, you know, you can't, you, you can't discount the heat because their skill goes beyond paper. But it didn't, and it hasn't. They they were really showed up in this series. So they're really um, exposed in this series. Uh, and all I, I think more credit should go to the Bucks than trash should go to the Heat. But you're right, but, Jimmy yeah. Butler has been very, very poor. Uh, I, I will just to sum it up, Nick. Uh, you, you've, you've summed it up pretty well there. You know, more credit for for the Bucks. I will also say, Jimmy, mate, sleep is good. Like I think sleep everyone has said that sleep is like LeBron James gets like twelve hours of sleep a night or something like that. It is in his hyperbolic that, time chamber or whatever. I actually, I actually do think that that's something that just as a big broad thing uh, about like work, work habits and work culture. Mm. Work, work smarter, not harder, my dude. Like you know, you don't have to be up for sixteen hours dribbling the basketball, sweating like crazy, building up those you know the lactic, the lactic acid and the the biceps that you got going on. Yeah, my dude's Jack, but ultimately health is the number one thing and, and rest is the number one thing you know whenever i hear you know elite athletes they always say the best thing for them the best advice for them is sleep so jimmy we got a long off season mate whatever you're doing with it you know, nine or ten hours you know i'm, I'm always refreshed I'd, I'd, I'd never been a nap before this podcast and i think that's why i'm bringing some outlandish takes and um swearing like a goddamn sailor on this one because you know, i had a nice little nappy oh very good jackie boy but off season at miami beach would be hard to sleep through Anyway, but you know, COVID. Uh, Just get the mask. You know, you can keep the mask on your face <laughs> and you know above your nose, and then keep it above your eyes as well. And you know, it's all kind of. You'll be keep, laughing. All... You'll be laughing. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Jackie boy, that just about does it for another week. So we'd just like to thank you for tuning in to Just More Things. We will have much more playoff action this week. It will be a good week of ball. As always, you can catch us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Player FM, Spreaker, Spotify, wherever it is you listen to your podcast, we will be there. Do us a solid, leave us a rating and review. If you're listening to us on Apple, helps us out a bunch in the ratings. Uh, if you're catching us on the YouTubes, which I hope you all are, we've got some visual elements in here, uh, make sure you subscribe to OTG Basketball, hit the notification bell so you know when fresh content comes out by OTG Network and make sure you like and comment on this video. Remember, it's you guys that make this show great, so we appreciate any and every post heading our way. So until next week. Keep bowling superstars.